Well, if you're new here, I don't know what's happening behind me, but something is. If you're new here, my name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here at the well. And um, this here, this is Cece, if you guys don't know her. Uh, Cece helps us out in worship. She, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, also, Cece has joined the team here at the well, and she is now our office administrator. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We're... We're excited to have her. We're excited. Uh, you know, it's just so evident how much she loves Jesus, how much she loves the church, that she is for ministry. And so uh, we think she's going to be a really exciting addition to the team. And now you guys know the face for our new office administrator, and we just want to welcome her right and, uh, and let you know how excited we are to have you. So thank you. All right. Well, how are we doing? Good. That's good. Um, so we are today starting a brand new series on prayer. Uh, so I've, I've been pretty excited about this one. This is one of the, the sermon series that I knew I was going to be preaching early on if you guys called me to be your pastor. So uh, it was on the calendar in expectation that I would be here. So I'm excited for this one. And so I grew up in church. So like from the moment basically that my parents were allowed to take me to church, I was there, right? And uh, so what that means is that I've basically heard every single Sunday school lesson that there is, right? Like all of them at this point. And, and that means that we talked about prayer plenty while I was growing up. But it was always a really short talk because the teacher would ask us, what is prayer? And we would say, talking to God, We've cracked the code. We've solved it. All right, we can move on. We did the thing, right? And so it was always this really short talk. But as I've continued to follow Jesus and as I've continued to work on drawing closer to him, I can't help but feel like there's something more to it than just talking to God. Now, especially in today's age, what does communication even mean, right? Right? Like, there are so many different mediums for communication at this point. I mean, we have in-person conversations, we have FaceTime, we have texting, we have Snapchat, we have Marco Polo, we have phone call. Well, people don't make phone calls anymore. But, but and maybe that's the thing, is that maybe we've been taught prayer that it's some sort of thing that it's, it's almost like we're leaving God a voicemail, and we're just hoping that he checks the answering machine in a timely manner right? Now, when I was in high school, uh, I had some, some friends of my friends, right? So not my friends, but friends of my friends who they said they knew a really cool place to hang out during lunch. So we were like, cool, that sounds fun. So we followed them. We went out past the baseball field. There had been a, a cut through the chain link fence at the end of the baseball field. And we went down into this dry canal and we were sitting like under an overpass basically. And uh, so we're just sitting down there hanging out. One of the friends of my friends pulls out this little brown piece of paper and he starts to put like this green stuff in it. And uh, I had no idea. I was a very sheltered child. So I'm like, I don't even know what this guy's doing. And uh, all of a sudden things were very smelly. And, and he got caught, which means that we got caught, right? And so I remember being marched back to the principal's office and we were told that the school would be calling our parents and telling them what had happened. Now, I knew what this meant. See, this was before everybody had cell phones. This meant I had to get to the answering machine before my parents did and delete the message. See, everybody over 30 in here knows what I'm talking about, right? You could, you could get there, you could do that. Well, I, I didn't make it. <laughs> I didn't get there in time. Um, so fortunately for me, I actually, I didn't get in trouble. My parents knew that I was way too much of a nerd to be smoking weed and moral of the story, always be a nerd. Um, that's my takeaway anyway. But see, I think that some of us are treating prayer like this, where it's just that thing on the answering machine. We, we don't really have an understanding of what's actually happening. And it's led many of us to this place where we barely even touch prayer. We think of it like, you know, I, I say the words, who knows what happens to them from there. They're probably on God's answering machine. 
I hope he gets to them before the devil erases them or something, right? <laughs> like we don't actually know what's happening. And so we're just like, you know what? I'm not that involved in it anyway. So we grow up thinking this way in church. And then we ask the question that I found myself asking a few years back. And so it's maybe a little crass, but the, way, the, the question that I was actually praying to God is why do I suck at prayer? Why is this so hard? Like, this is supposed to be just part of following you, Jesus. I got the Bible reading down. Loving people's hard, but I'm doing okay. Praying, though? Like, it's hard. Why is this so hard, Jesus? And while there are a number of contributing factors, there are three in particular that I want to look at today. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be kind of all over the place, but we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. And, uh, and all the passages will be up on the screen as well. So starting in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 5, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. What does this mean in today's context? This means that you're the kind of person who only prays in church right? Like you're, you're waiting for that moment where maybe you get a microphone. Maybe it's like you only pray at youth group or only at the Bible studies. Maybe you pray just before meals, something like that. Something where other people hear you and you get to pray out loud, right? Now, the funny thing about this is that I actually, I have a decent amount of empathy for this because when I first answered God's call to pursue vocational ministry, I very quickly found out that everyone expected me to be the one who would pray in public, right? You know, whenever there's like, you're having dinner, and it's like, oh, we should pray first. <laughs> and it, all those eyes drift to me, and I'm like, I know the question's coming, right? Anytime there was an opportunity for somebody to pray in public, I knew it was going to be me, right? Now, what I also knew, just because I answered this call of God doesn't mean that I am any more holy than anybody else, right? Like, I am no further along in my spiritual journey than anybody else. I was just like, I think God's calling me this thing. I'll probably just answer him and see how it works out. And, you know, who knows what will happen, right? And so the reason that I have empathy for those who live their lives in a way that all you do is you pray at church and you don't have the prayer life anywhere else is because what I realized early on is that there was a tremendous weight to perform right? Like there was this weight that I had to have the most robust prayer. This guy's following God. He better have the best prayer, right? Like people were expecting a man of God to open his mouth in a way that the clouds were going to split and the spirit of God was going to descend like a dove. And the voice of the father would speak out and say, this is my son whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased, right? Like that's what, okay, maybe that was a little exaggerated. But you definitely feel like you have to have this awesome prayer, otherwise people are, they're going to be let down. If you're like, God is good, God is great, thank you for this food we eat, they're like, did you just go to preschool yesterday? <laughs> like, come on, dude. And do you know what the result of all of this is? Really shallow prayers. Really shallow prayers. Having to pray in public like that didn't teach me how to pray. It taught me how to perform. I started to notice how often other people, when they were praying, would pray, dear Lord, 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 Lord. And I'm like, don't do that, <laughs> right? Like, you can perform better than that, Seth. It had absolutely no spiritual impact. on. In, in fact, I would actually say it did have a spiritual impact on me, but strictly in the negative, right? Because my prayer life was now completely fueled by pride. 
Everything about my prayer life was just about pride. And some of us in this room, that's the only way that we pray. When we're praying in public and we're performing, and it's actually for our pride more than it is for prayer. We pray in public and we make a show out of it, whether we're trying to or not. We babble like Jesus says the pagans do, and there's absolutely no connection with God. It's for the people in the room. And then we wonder why behind closed doors at home, we're actually so bad at prayer. We wonder why we can't figure this out. So how, how do we grow beyond this? Jesus tells us to go into a secret place to pray. He tells us we, we don't need a babel because the Father already knows exactly what we need. Now, the ancients had a terrific sort of prayer to combat this sort of praying like the, the hypocrites do. But I'm going to warn you, it's really hard to master. Okay, it's, it's easy in principle, but it's hard to master. See, we can grow beyond this hypocritical type of prayer by a prayer called contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer. One time there was a reporter who was interviewing Mother Teresa, and he was asking her about her prayer life. And he asked her what she says to God when she prays. She paused for a minute, and she thought about it, and she said, not much, really. I mostly listen. And so now the reporter's actually really intrigued. He's like, okay, okay. So then when you pray, what does God say to you? She thought about it again. Not much, really. He mostly listens. Right? Now, now some of you are just as confused as the reporter was. Some of you are maybe more confused about contemplative prayer now than you were before. Here's what John Mark Comer says about contemplative prayer. He says, quote, To contemplate is to look, to gaze upon the beauty of God, receiving His love pouring out towards you in Christ and by the Spirit, and then giving your love back in return, unquote. So to practice contemplative prayer is to be in the presence of your Father in love. Just as you might sit with a spouse, just enjoying the existence of each other, right? Like how you guys might just sit on the couch. You don't have to be talking to each other, but you just enjoy that, that you're both there, right? That's like the early days of dating, right? Especially for those of you who are millennials like me, as soon as those unlimited minutes on your phone became a thing, game on, right? <laughs> You're like, yes, I will be on the phone with you all night. I just, I'm going to fall asleep on the phone. I just want to be on the phone with you. I love you so much. You know, you guys are laughing, but you get it, right? Like, I just want you on the other side of the phone. But this is contemplative prayer, right? I just want to be in your, it's, it's a way of entering into the presence of God and without saying a word, saying, I'm giving you the first word, God. I am simply here. I'm present and that is enough. If you want to speak, great. If you don't, it's enough to just be in your presence. Now, when I began doing contemplative prayers, I would just set a five-minute timer on my phone. Do you guys realize how hard it is to sit in silence for five minutes and to stay focused on something? Whew. Five minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but all of a sudden, it is hours, right? Like, and you better believe that I got distracted, that I'm just, I mean, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm praying, I'm like, focus on the Father, focus on the Father. Fo when was the last time I had mozzarella sticks? <laughs> right? Like, you know, it's, it's the weirdest stuff that comes to your mind in these moments. And you're like, wait, wait, no, no, the Father, focus on the, right? But here's what you need to know. It's practice, right? Yes, I, I want, I, the reason I share this is because if you try it, this will happen to you. You will get distracted. And I don't want you to feel like you're failing because you're not, you're practicing right? And that five minutes, eventually, you do learn to focus on the Father and to just sit in His presence. And that five minutes turns into 10 minutes. And that 10 minutes into half an hour, that half an hour into an hour, that you can just sit and be present with the Holy King in the room. And the weight of that, what that changes in your life. But it's practice. Following Jesus is always practice. 
Now, the second thing that we do to make ourselves so bad at prayer is we only pray for miracles, right? The second reason that so many of us are so bad at prayer is because we have a tendency to pray like Jonah. See, I I think this is actually where the vast majority of us are. Look at Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 17. So Jonah 1, 17 and chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, now Yahweh provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to Yahweh his God. Now, if you know the story of Jonah, then you know that Jonah's minding his own business, and God reached out, and he's like, Jonah, I need you to go share my message with these people. And Jonah's like, or I could run away, right? And he takes off. He, he gets on a ship going in the exact opposite direction. And he's on this ship. He goes to sleep, and there's this huge storm. And, and the people on the ship are panicking. And Jonah's just sleeping and, you know, just being a fool. And then all these people are panicking on the ship, and they're, they're starting to throw things overboard, and they're freaking out, and they're like, Keep in mind, these are not Jews. So they're like, there are all these gods. I don't know which one's mad at us. So pray to all of them, right? And Jonah wakes up, he comes out and they're like, Jonah, we're praying to all the gods to stop this. Who's your God? And he's like, oh, I I worship Yahweh, the God of heavens and earth and the seas. And they're like, okay, can you pray to him for us? And Jonah, and what I believe was a final effort of selfishness to run from God. He says, you know what? Just throw me overboard. He had this opportunity to pray to Yahweh. He's like, just throw me overboard. Because if I die, then God can't make me go preach. <laughs> and so they throw him over. And God's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and this fish swallows him. And this is the first time in the story that Jonah prays. What? How is this the first time? And yet, we look at that, and I think so many of us, if our lives were written down and placed, if there was the book of Seth, and people are reading through it, I guarantee you all of us would be like, how is this the first time you're praying, Seth? 99% of what went wrong in your life would have been figured out if you just would have owned up and talked to God a long time ago. Right? But it's not until we're in the pits of despair. We're like, all right, there's no way out of this. God... I'd like a miracle, please. Right? That's what we do. We have this tendency to only pray when we need a miracle. When someone's sick, when we're scared, when money's tight, when we are completely at the end of our rope. That's when we finally turn to prayer. Now, unlike the first example, praying in the depths of your suffering actually can develop your relationship with God quite a bit. But we were never meant to pray exclusively from the depths of our suffering. See, we look at examples like Daniel, and he was praying even after the king had made it illegal, and that led to him being thrown into the lion's den. Now, the difference between Daniel and Jonah is that Daniel didn't start praying in the lion's den. Daniel kept praying in the lion's den right? That's an important difference. It's an important distinction. So many of us were like, ah, we're in the lion's den. Please help God, right? We haven't been praying since then, but now's the time. Now, in ancient times, the nations surrounding the Israelites, they believed in this pantheon of gods. There was a God of fertility, a God for rain, a God for love, a God for war, and on and on and on and on. Our problem is that we're praying like the pagan nations, we pray to the God of crisis, right? That's the reason we don't speak up until we truly need to. That's the reason we don't pray until we're deep in the pit of despair because the God we're crying out to is in our minds just the God of crisis. That's when I need him, when I'm in crisis. And this can be detrimental to our relationship with God because what happens when your only prayer is the prayer of the crisis, and it doesn't get answered the way you hoped. Right? Like, I remember praying for another pastor's daughter who had cancer. And man, I believed so hard. And I was so excited to be able to pray through this and be like, see, see, I told you God was going to heal your daughter. 
until the healing didn't happen. Until cancer took his daughter. And so, if that's my only form of prayer, if I only pray for the miracles, then what did that just do to my relationship with God? Right? When I'm only praying for miracles and the miracles don't come, then what's the point of praying at all? See how dangerous this gets? So how do we repair a prayer life that's been shaped by only praying for miracles? Have you ever wondered what God's will is for your life? Okay, like three of you have. You're in luck. I have a verse for the three of you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, listen to this. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's what? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is his will for you. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. And right smashed in the middle, there's this command to pray continually. Or you may have heard it before, praying without ceasing. I think that Paul smashed this in the middle because how do you rejoice always? How, how do you give thanks in all circumstances? Well, you kind of need to be in continual prayer to do that, right? And this is God's will for you. See, shortly after this, Paul asks God that he would sanctify you, or in other words, set you apart. And that he would set you apart via your soul, spirit, and body. This is how that happens. This is the how. Through continually being so deeply connected with God that you can rejoice and give thanks and prayer in every moment of your life. And once again, this is really simple in principle, but really difficult to actually live out. See, I've, I've shared with you guys before that I've an issue with, even with people just talking about blood. And uh, specifically, my problem is I, that I lose consciousness. Uh, um, I, just, I just pass out. It's, it's so convenient. Uh, um, so this means that even though we have four kids, which means four chances, I was never able to be in the room for the birth. And for Nora, our fourth, I really, really tried. Like Xanax and everything were involved. And I was like, I am going to be there. And then as I'm laying on the floor in the hospital having a panic attack, the nurse is like, no, you are not. Right? She is like, you are staying here and you are not allowed anywhere near the operating room. Right? So as I'm sitting in that room alone, knowing how desperately my wife wanted me in the room with her, but I'm not... How do I rejoice? How do I give thanks? Right? Those are the difficult moments. But this should remind us again of the problem with praying for a miracle. This isn't where we start. Right? For so many of us, we get in these circumstances, we're like, okay, God, I don't know how to rejoice about this. And he's like, I know. Start easier, dude. Right? Like, how often do we actually thank God when he does answer our prayers? right? We've been told to rejoice always, to give thanks in all circumstances, but even when it's the easiest, we have a tendency not to even do that. So to combat the kind of prayer life that only prays for miracles, we start easy. And we take some time every single morning to rejoice that God woke us up again. And then we give thanks. And every evening, we ask God, Remind me of all the highlights of my day. Remind me of the places where I saw your goodness today. And then rejoice and give thanks. And now you've bookended your day with prayer, just like Paul bookended praying without ceasing. And now what you do is you start to take these baby steps on both sides until finally you're praying without ceasing. Until finally you've cracked the code. You figured it out. It's not that you figured out the secret thing to make you good at prayer. It's that you worked at it. It's that you followed Jesus hard and that you covered your life in the kind of prayer he called you to have. You have filled your day with the kind of prayer that relentlessly pursues 
Jesus. Now, there's one more area that causes us to be really bad at prayer, and that's that we treat God like a genie, right? James, in chapter 4, in the second half of verse 2, he says, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. See, some of us are just plain bad at prayer because we treat it like God is a genie. And listen, can, can I be transparent with you guys for a moment? Okay, you have to promise not to judge me. First service didn't promise. You guys are new favorite service. Just don't tell them. So see, I've told you guys that I'm a huge Anaheim Ducks fan. I love hockey, right? And once upon a time, they were actually a good hockey team. It was crazy. And uh, I remember I was watching this playoff game. And so for two years in a row, the Ducks had made it to the playoffs and they had lost game seven at home, two years in a row. And so now this year three, we're at game six on the road. And if they lose, game seven goes back home. And I'm like, I know it's bad news if they go back. Like, if they don't win this game, it's over. And so I'm sitting there watching this game, and I start thinking to myself, you know, God does say to cast all our cares upon him. I kind of care about the outcome of the game. So like, you know, and, and, and guess what? The Ducks lost at home for a third year in a row. <laughs> Turns out... Turns out God makes a terrible genie, but I think that's actually in our best interest, yeah. right? And all of this goes back to that initial definition that we have of prayer. When we decide that prayer is just talking to God, I think that we look at prayer as this distinct part of Christianity and not as if it is deeply entangled within the fabric of what it means to follow Jesus. The hypocrites prayed for show. Jonah's prayer only happened because he got caught. James says your prayers aren't being answered because your heart isn't even aligned with Jesus yet. In each of these scenarios, the problem is that people are just talking to God. They're not talking with God, right? They're not seeing prayer as an opportunity to be with God. We treat God like a genie because ultimately, to many of us, that's all he really is right? He's not our king. He's not our savior. He's not our father. He's just a genie who we're banking on giving us the things that we ask for because he's more powerful than we are. And James literally calls us out by saying that our motivation behind the prayers is the fulfillment of our own pleasures. But what if? What if when we prayed, it was still for our pleasure but our pleasure was totally aligned with Jesus. See, that's the key to combating prayer to God as if he's just a genie. Here's John chapter 15, verse 7. Here's the words of Jesus. Jesus in John 15, 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, this makes it seem pretty clear that as long as we're remaining in Jesus, we can pray for whatever we want and we'll get it, right? Well, kind of, if, if you're properly understanding what it means to remain in Jesus. That's what all of this hinges on, right? We think sometimes that, okay, Jesus, you said I pray for whatever I ask for and I get it, so I'm in a tight financial situation. I could use... $300,000, right? I mean, if I'm going to shoot for it, I got to shoot high, right? Hopefully that wasn't too low, God. And he's like, no, 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 you're missing it. Remain in me. See, Jesus uses the word remain 10 times in 10 verses. This sort of repetition only happens with little kids when they're being absolutely obnoxious. Or or when Jesus is trying to tell us one of the most important things that he communicates in all of the Gospels. See, I reached out to my friend Philip about this because, because he has remained tattooed on his arm, and I think that makes him an expert. I think that's the rule. Uh, and he told, me, he told me that there are some people who they believe that to remain in Jesus is just about salvation. 
It's just about once you get saved. And, and he struggles with that because just being saved doesn't make the rest of this verse make sense, right? If you're saved, God doesn't just give you everything that you want. There are a lot of people in this room who know that the hard way, myself included. It means that you are actively making the choice every single day to remain in Jesus and to live as if he is the only source of life and completely necessary for you to just make it through another day. Like the only way for me to get from morning to evening is if I remain in Jesus and if I don't, all bets are off. That's what it means to remain in Jesus. And as I was talking with Philip about this, I, I asked him, I was like, you know, we've, we've talked a lot at the church about the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And so I asked him, I was like, so is there a difference between remaining in Jesus and loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? In a profound answer. Here's, here's what he said. <laughs> no. No. So no wonder Jesus talks about this so much. No wonder he tells us to remain so many times. It all comes back to the greatest commandment. Can you remain in Jesus without loving him with every part of your being? No. Can you love Jesus with everything without remaining in him? No. So when we talk about being fully transformed disciples, this is what we're talking about. To be fully transformed is to remain in Jesus. This is what combats treating God like a genie. Because when you see Jesus as life, then suddenly the things that you care about are the things that he always cared about. Your prayers suddenly begin to sound a lot like your will be done on earth as in heaven. And then, and then does Jesus give you everything that you're asking for? When you're praying his prayers, they do. When your pleasures are aligned with him, when your loves are aligned with him, when your affections are aligned with him, when everything that you want is based on what Jesus is leading you in, that's when this verse makes sense. That's when this starts to make sense. See, in Dallas Willard's biography, there was a story of a time where he was a co-pastor. So there were two senior pastors at the church. And one of the other pastors, he comes to Dallas Willard. He's super excited. And he says, Dallas, you won't believe it. This guy had just accepted Jesus into his heart. And Dallas sat. He pondered this for a moment. Always very slow and methodical was Dallas Willard. And he finally speaks up. And he says, well, I hope that's good for them. But I really hope that one day they decide to make Jesus their life. Right? Right? And that's ultimately what we're talking about. Why are we so bad at prayer? Because we've just made Jesus a little part of our life. We haven't made him our life. There's such a huge difference between accepting Jesus into my life and letting him have a part of it versus saying, Jesus, I give you everything. I give you myself. You are my life. And I think that so many of us are still holding on to these little idols in our lives, terrified of what it might look like to let them go and give them over to Jesus. So how do we combat treating God like a genie? We remain in Jesus. We actively choose to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And we actively choose that every single day. We let our lives be totally transformed by who Jesus is. Where the things that we pray for are the same things that he's praying for. Where the things that we're about are the same things that he's about. Where when you're caring for a loved one and you're praying for healing and you're praying for these things, you realize that you are praying for the same things Jesus is. And that Jesus is right there alongside you praying to the Father himself. Man, what a difference that would make in our lives. It means that we pray even when it's hard. Even when we don't have the words. We practice contemplative prayer. We practice rejoicing and giving thanks for everything. We take baby steps towards making Jesus the center of our lives. This is what it means to remain in Jesus and for him to remain in us. This is the gospel, that the life within us is so full of death 
and decay and destruction. And so Jesus, knowing how desperately we cannot fix ourselves, he comes to us and he offers us his life. But he says that in order to receive his life, we have to take all of it. It's everything or nothing. We fully give ourselves over to Jesus, not just making him a part of our lives, but making him our life. And so I have just one takeaway for us today. One takeaway for today. Set a daily reminder on your phone for the rest of this month to pray in a new way. It doesn't mean pray in a new way every single day. It means choosing something like contemplative prayer, where you sit and you sit in the presence of Jesus, and that is simply enough. Or you choose to bookend your day with rejoicing and giving thanks. And you do this. You pick the one type of prayer, and you do it every single day for the rest of the month. Give it through the rest of this month, and see how that impacts your prayer life. See how that changes things for you. See how God is willing to transform you and answer with yes when you pray, God, make me better at prayer. Because he will. So as we have the band come back up, let's pray together this morning. God, we just want to thank you that even in our own selfishness, even when we follow you in ways that are self-serving, you have grace upon grace. And Jesus, I just ask that this morning you would help to transform each of us, that you would transform the well to follow you and love you better in prayer, that you would help us to draw close to you, to remain in you, to actively choose that every single day, even when it's hard. God, I pray that we would be a church of prayer, that we would be a church so consumed with following you that we would see affirmative answers to prayers left and right because we're praying the same things that you're praying, Jesus. Give us your heart. Give us your will, your desire, and help us to live that out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go into this last song, I'm going to be in the back in the cafe area, area. We'll have some prayer partners back there as well. If you do need prayer today, don't leave today without coming and seeing one of us letting us pray with you this morning.